So thank you for everyone who's joining our webinar today on grandparent rights. Um, we are pleased to be uh, have our presentation today by uh, Mr. Andrew Feldstein, um, who's a founder of Feldstein Family Law Group. Um, just a reminder, our organization is funded through the Ministry of Seniors and Accessibility. Uh, any of the information and that is um, disclosed and talked about today is not a representative or does not um, represent the Ontario government, but uh, uh, our org of the uh, the speaker and our organization. Just before we begin, I'd like to give our land acknowledgement um, for our webinars as we usually do. So we acknowledge that we gather on the traditional territory of a number of First Nations and acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. We seek a new relationship with the people, original peoples of this land, one is that is based in honor and deep respect. Just a few housekeeping items uh, before we begin. Uh, all attendees will be muted during the webinar. Our speaker will be visible when he's uh, asked to present his presentation. As I mentioned, we do have ASL interpreters with us today and they are visual uh, on your screen. You can pin the ASL interpreter, uh, or you can make the screen larger by pulling the image frame to the left um, to make those images larger. Um, or you can have it in speaker view. At the top, there is a little grid and you can make your own preference how you want to see the presentation today. Just a reminder, as I mentioned, there is a chat box. So I see people have been putting uh, little uh, chats in the, the chat box. If you wanna write where you're coming from, that's always helpful. We do get people coming from different provinces and territories, um, sometimes even cross borders. Uh, if you would like to share that, that's great. Um, as I mentioned before, a reminder for the question and answer box to post that in that a specific area. So we make sure that your question's answered. As you know, we are recording the webinar and it will be posted on our website um, today or tomorrow for future viewing. And then after the presentation, we do ask people to, to complete a short evaluation just to let us know your feedback on today's session. And lastly, before we begin, we do respect privacy and confidentiality of all of our attendees. And we know that sometimes the webinars that we do present um, are on uh, issues that could uh, be related to personal circumstances or issues. So we do like to make sure that we are respecting your privacy and confidentiality. So if you have uh, a question, um, maybe just putting that in more general terms as opposed to specific names uh, of individuals, that kind of thing. So we make sure that um, we can address them. And um, as this is a public forum, uh, we also do want to respect that privacy confidential um, conversation. Uh, if you would like to speak with us after, you can reach out to us um, uh, through telephone or email um, about any specific situation that you would like to discuss in further detail. For those who are joining us um, for the first time or haven't are familiar with our organization, Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario envisions um, an Ontario where all seniors are free from abuse, have a strong voice, feel safe and respected. And we do that through raising awareness, delivering education and training, working collaboratively with our community organizations, both provincially and regionally, and even across borders, um, to ensure there's better coordination and advocacy uh, for older adults uh, in Ontario. Now, as I mentioned, we are funded through the Ontario government under the Ministry for Seniors and Accessibility. Our mandate, um, we were given the mandate to implement Ontario's strategy to combat elder abuse back in 2002, and we continue to do so today. And our really, our role and, and focus is, you know, really stopping abuse and restoring respect. And that has been our tagline for many years, and we continue to work towards that goal. With the strategy that we are working on, we have three main priorities within that, that we are um, responsible for and undertake many initiatives and activities uh, under each of these priority areas. So the first one is education and awareness, where we do provide uh, many sessions for older adults, including today's webinar, 
where we do outreach to inform individuals about different issues. We do public education campaigns. So just recently in June, we had World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. So there was many initiatives, not only within our organization, but across the country uh, and the world, trying to raise awareness of this important issue. We also do training for frontline staff in all sectors, which has even expanded uh, over the years um, from financial institutions to education to healthcare. Um, you name it, we're kind of providing that education when people reach out to us for information and knowledge skill development in responding to situations of abuse. And lastly, we work on collaborating with our community partners because this is a, a community response. We have to work together to support older adults in the community. And we do that through building those partnerships and promoting uh, the roles and responsibilities of each organization amongst each other and to older adults in the community so they know to where to reach out for help and support. And that's a big undertaking uh, in Ontario because we uh, every community is different. So um, we take great effort in trying to improve that response within each community. Just a little bit about our, uh, our staffing. We, um, we have a staff of eight uh, provincial consultants, a senior leadership, um, and we are working um, with a virtual service model delivery because of COVID. Um, so we are doing many of ed education sessions and training uh, on a virtual model right now through uh, Zoom primarily. Um, we also work to collaborate with our elder abuse prevention networks. So in Ontario, there's 37 networks um, that support uh, Francophone um, um, seniors. We're building capacity within that area, um, Indigenous communities. Um, but if you're in a region where you um, aren't, aren't knowing or if you don't know there's a network, um, we do have on our website a listing of all the networks across Ontario. So if you're interested in volunteering or getting engaged, I'd encourage you to maybe check if there's a network in your region that you made, if you're interested, to get involved in. Um, and we also invested um, when a lot of uh, vital projects and research to advance elder abuse prevention, not only nationally, but internationally. So um, not only we do the work within the uh, strategy, priorities, but we also do many, many initiatives beyond that as well. If you haven't had a chance, you can look at our website. We have many uh, resources and tools available for you to download or have access to. Um, we are on all social media channels, so we're constantly posting information and resources uh, as well. And you can contact us for information and referral. One thing, um, we, we are not case, case case managers, so we do not do case interventions, but we do have a really good connection with our community resources to get you in touch with the right individuals or organizations who can help you, um, it, with, depending on the situations that uh, you may need support in. And as I mentioned, we have many resources. This is just a, um, a couple of the ones that uh, fact sheets. We have a directory that you can download. Um, we have a resource guide um, on different all forms of abuse. Uh, and you can find all these tools, as I said, on our website. So I wanted to give just a quick introduction before I turn it over to our speaker. Um, so when we're talking about elder abuse and the, the, the forms that we refer to in, in our training and education, we, we refer to the World Health Organization's definition of abuse, which is a single repeated act or lack of action occurring where there's a relationship of trust that causes harm or distress to an older adult. And the, as I always stress that it's important to know that there's that a relationship component, and there's an expectation of trust um, and the harm that's caused to the older person. So we're not really talking about strangers per se, that someone you don't know, although we do know that that happens with frauds and scams. Um, but when the, the terminology around elder abuse is around that relationship where there is trust um, in, in, that, uh, in that context. And experts have done many research uh, on um, the trying to find out the, the extent of this problem. And the World Health Organization says it's one in six older adults that are experiencing abuse. Um, and in, in Canada, 
Um, there was a study and it's between eight to 10% of seniors experiencing some form of abuse as well. So um, we know that the, the different forms and prevalence is um, uh, you know, stagger, it's astonishing when you think about the emotional uh, abuse that people um, experience as well as the financial impact uh, as well. And they all don't just uh, occur in isolation. They usually um, overlap with one another. So if someone's experienced like a financial situation, there's probably some emotional impact uh, as a result of that. And for those who are um, causing those abusive behaviors, we usually find that it's family members. So that could be a spouse, a partner, a child, grandchild, son, daughter, could be a neighbor, an informal caregiver, or it could be a paid caregiver or professional um, because they are in those positions of trust where we see that happening. And, and we, um, we just, sometimes we think that, you know, it may not happen um, in my family or it might not happen to my, in my neighborhood. But the fact is, you know, when we look at statistics, one in six older adults experience this. Um, in fact, it may be someone that, uh, that you know or in your community that may be experiencing these forms of abuse. And some of the risk factors, I'm not going to go into big detail, but there are relationship risk factors that you know, cause um, some emotional, there's, when there's higher financial or emotional dependence upon an older adult. So sometimes it's uh, maybe it's an adult child who's dependent on the older adult um, that may cause an increased risk because they're asking for or demanding uh, financial resources or doing that emotional uh, uh, abuse to the older person. Maybe there's past family conflict that's causing um, continued uh, escalation of a risk factor causing abuse. Um, the inability um, or to establish or maintain those positive relationships, um, or maybe there's a lack of social support um, that increases the risk um, for abuse to occur. And in some cases, those are who are abusive, uh, maybe as I indicated, maybe dependent on uh, another older adult for you know food, money, housing, transportation. Um, there could be issues of a substance abuse or gambling, um, poor physical health. Maybe there's an ageist attitudes, you know, that they don't prioritize or see in the older adults as equal and uh, undermine their abilities and decision making powers. And there's sometimes there's um, uh, resignation or obligation to feel that they are the only ones that have to caregive and there's resentment that results as a result of that and they take it out on someone. So there's many, many factors. These are just some of the high, some of the um, behaviors that we do come across um, when we hear about situations. And because we were talking about grandparent rights, I just wanted to focus just a little bit on emotional uh, abuse where someone is, um, feeling that emotional impact that lessens a person's feeling of identity, uh, dignity, and self-worth. So isolation is a big part of that, as, um, uh, as we've learned, you know, where there's no access or denial of connection with family, grandchildren, friends, agency supports, um, that could cause very stressful and affect the mental health and well-being of, of older adults. And, and many times it's a power imbalance where someone is making those decisions and choices over an uh, older person and they don't have um, the ability to feel that they can speak up um, um, to stop that situation. So it sometimes can cause fear or discomfort or nervousness um, around families. And, um, and, and there's many, many um, you know, forms of uh, emotional abuse. People could be yelling, you know, uh, threatening, belittling, um, you know, harassment and can take its toll around emotional abuse. And as we're in the context that we're going to be talking about today, sometimes um, in, you know, in looking into this further, the, um, the term around parent alienation, which does uh, in some cases involve um, grandparents, children of grandparents as, as part of that um, in terms of the non-custodial parent that might be involved in terms of a separation or a divorce, um, that they don't have access or um, connections to, to the grandchild, which is what uh, our speaker will be talking about today. And seniors do have rights in Ontario, and our speaker will talk about the, the laws that re relate to grandparents today. Um, but in Ontario, seniors do have um, the rights 
And you'll see here the list around making decisions with uh, your own decisions, uh, choose what's best for yourself, the expectation of services to support yourself to live independently in the community, to maintain control over your own destiny and decisions, and to preserve your maintain your quality of life. And lastly, um, you know, EAPO strives to uphold the rights of older adults, including, uh, you know, diverse cultural um, customs, language differences, religious beliefs, sexual orientation, and lifestyle choices. Um, all of these factors are, are extremely important in the rights of older adults. Um, and when we're talking about rights, it's it's uh, that's where we're going to focus on today is the rights of grandparents. And uh, in terms of those, the legislation that pertains to um, to grandparents and the laws, and I know there was some recent, well, there was changes. I'm not so sure it's recent anymore, um, but there was changes in the laws, which our uh, speaker will talk to. So Andrew uh, Feldstein, who is a founder, as I mentioned, uh, of Feldstein Family Law Group, um, graduated from Osgoode Hall in 1992. Uh, prior to focusing on family law. He covered uh, many areas, including corporate um, commercial law, and he was also appointed to the Dispute Resolution Office uh, panel in, in Newmarket, where he served there for seven years. And that was really based on his uh, ability to resolve uh, complex family law using issues, uh, using alternative to the traditional court methods, including collaborative family law process. Um, he's also a member of the Law Society of Ontario, the York Region Law Association, and also a past member of the Ontario Bar Association Council and National Council. And I know he's been on many TV uh, programs, been interviewed by many media um, programs. He's been on YouTube. They have YouTube channels where he does a lot of education and outreach. So we are so pleased to have Andrew join us today and share his wealth of knowledge with us um, as we uh, um, walk through our presentation today. So, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Okay, so I hope everyone can see my screen for my presentation on grandparents' rights. Not yet. It's not up there. I thought I hit share screen. Let me bear with me because. There we go, it's coming. Okay. That's perfect, yep, yeah, perfect. All right, I got to the right page. My apologies. No problem. Grandparents' rights because family matters. And the terminology, most people are familiar with the terms custody and access. And in March of 2020, the terminology was done away with and they've been replaced. So now custody is called decision-making responsibility and access is a contact order. And that's what you'll hear me referring to. And situations when grandparents' rights may become relevant. And I say this not to say that other times they're not relevant, but in the eyes of the law, the grandparents' rights are more significant under these circumstances. So when you have two parents and one of them passes away, the grandparent of the parent that passed has more rights than the typical grandparent. They can make uh, requests to have parenting time slash contact with their grandchildren in a much stronger way than typical grandparents would. It also occurs when parents doesn't have a good relationship with their child, but grandparents do. And I'm going to circle back to these after I go through this. So parents are still together, but refuse grandparents contact. contact. Parents move to another country. Grandparents think parents aren't responsible or unable to care for the child, or a grandparent has acted as a primary caregiver for some time. So I gave a little bit about the situation of a death of a parent, but the other places that we deal with this can happen when a grandparent is estranged from their child, and that impacts the relationship with the grandchildren. That's probably the worst of all cases to be in a grandparent situation. And I say that because generally speaking, the courts will defer to the parent that the parent is capable of making 
the decision as to what's in the best interest of the child or children. And in this case, if it's an intact family and both parents have made a decision that the grandparent uh, shouldn't see their children, most likely, but not always, the courts will not grant that grandparent parenting time. Uh, we have situations, uh, like I talked about, where the parents are together and refuse contact. There's also the situation in divorced families or separated families where one parent moves to another country and the children are still here. That's a case where frequently in the negotiation process of the separation or thereafter a grandparent may end up negotiating some parenting time for themselves. I say that because the general premise is that grandparents will get parenting time with the kids, or I should say grandchildren, when the grandchildren are with the parent that is their child. So if I'm separated, I have my time this weekend, my parents can see the children during my time, and my parents really can't go ahead and bring a court application to see the children during my former spouse's parenting time, unless you get into one of these pigeonholes. Uh, there's always the risk, and I say risk, is the grandparents may think the children are just poor parents. They could be drug addicts, they could be alcoholics, uh, they could be abusive. In those cases, the grandparents could come forward and make a claim that uh, they should be given the decision making and should be the kids should live with them being the grandchildren. There's also the situation sometimes where grandparents has acted as the primary caregiver for some time. It could be that one of the children had these problems and the grandparents is taking care of the child or children, and they could be going to court and asking for an order that the children be living with them. Now, what's the legislative scheme that allows this to happen? There's two different legislations that apply. One is the Divorce Act and one is the Children Law Reform Act. So this screen shows you the provincial legislation, which is the Children's Law Reform Act. This is where some amendments were made a few years ago, as, as was said uh, recently, not so recently, is Section 21 sub 2 that says any person other than the parent of a child, including a grandparent, may apply to a court for a parenting order respecting decision-making responsibilities with respect to the child. And then they have similar language for 21 sub 3 for contact. The biggest difference when they made this change was to specifically identify grandparents as having the ability to do that. The legislation was there before, but it didn't include the word grandparent in it. Again, I think you fit into most likely one of the items that I said in the last screen that deals more along the lines of, has someone passed away? Has somebody relocated? Was there a separation? Now, there's also legislation that's federal, which is in the Divorce Act of 1985, and that's Section 16.5, Contact Orders, which says a court of competent jurisdiction may, on application by a person other than a spouse, make an order providing for contact between that person and a child of the marriage. And you may note, in the federal legislation, it doesn't have the word grandparent. Now, you may scratch your head and say, why is there one set of federal legislation and another set of provincial legislation that seems to cover the same things? As exciting as it may be, it goes back to the Constitution Act of 1867 and division of powers, which usually bores most people. Suffice it to say, though, that the federal government has control over marriages and the laws they make. So if the children were married and, and then they're divorced or in the process of getting divorced, then the federal legislation is paramount and the Divorce Act would apply. If they never got married or never got divorced, then you would deal with the provincial legislation. So either way, so predominantly common law people would be under the provincial legislation. And when I say people, I'm talking about the parents of the child. So the grandparents would pursue either legislation. I wouldn't uh, be too fussed about the different wording in that the provincial legislation says grandparents and the federal legislation does not. Uh, my view is it really wouldn't make a difference practically when you're in court. And as you can see from the next screen, it's what is the test? How does a court make a decision of what should happen to the grandchildren? And the Divorce Act at Section 16 discusses that. And 
It says the court shall take into consideration only the best interests of the child of the marriage in making a parenting order or a contact order. And it's interesting because it says only the best interests of the child of the marriage. And this is something I frequently have to remind my clients about because people like to view as a parent, I have rights. And I frequently remind them that as a parent, you have responsibilities. It's not a right. And it's typically in the best interests of the children, most courts would say this, that they should have a relationship with both parents. It's typically in the best interests of children to have a relationship with all their grandparents. That, that's where people are starting off from. And you need to remember that when I go to court and I appear in front of judges, judges are typically in their 50s or older. So it means either they're parents of older children and thinking of grandchildren coming along in the future or many judges I've appeared of in front of our grandparents. So they are looking at it from a perspective of a grandparent and how they would feel it, feel being in the situation of being estranged. But it's important to understand the test is what's best for the child, not what's best for the parent, not what's best for the grandparent. And in fact, and this is what's really new, is in March of 2020, the Divorce Act had some significant amendments, uh, first ones in a long time, and they actually created what are the factors that a court should look at in determining the best interests of the child. And I've highlighted on here what I think are the items that would be most important in a, grand, in a case dealing with either uh, parenting decisions or a contact order for grandparents. And as you can see, item B, nature and strength of the child's relationship with each spouse, each of the child's siblings and grandparents, specifically enunciated there in subparagraph B. And this is one where I think of cases where a grandparent has had a really good relationship with a grandchild, even if it's an intact family, because the provincial legislation will be very similar in this regard. So I'm not so fussed that this is what's in the federal and the provincial is different because they're going to be very, very similar in every section dealing with these issues. And the fact of the matter is if the grandparents have been an act active in the children's lives and then for some reason the parent decides, I just don't want the grandparent to, to see the child anymore, uh, that may be a problem that the grandparents could go to court. So when I think of situations that are similar to this, is I picture a grandparent who has been financially generous to their child and then decides, A, stock market reversals have occurred and I can't be so generous, and the child decides they're going to cut off access to the grandchildren to be punitive to the parent. In that situation, the grandparent may have a very good claim saying, listen, the child's 10 years old for the past since the child's born. Every Friday night, the child would come to my house, have dinner at my house, have a sleepover at my house, and I'd return the child on Saturday afternoon. We have a great relationship. I take the child to, to hockey on Saturdays, and I'm involved in this child's life. You may have a very good case to go to court and say, this decision is wrong, even though there's going to be deference given. It wasn't in the best interest of the child, and the grandparent should be given that parenting time even against intact family. Now, the part where it becomes tricky is what was the dispute really about? Is it because they were cut off or is the parent going to say, well, actually that grandparent was always saying horrific things about my spouse and saying how awful my spouse is and they're not good enough for, for me and they, I should be leaving my spouse and on and on and on. And in that scenario, the court could say, well, yeah, we're going to defer to the parents. That makes sense. So there can be a very dynamic type of case where facts really do matter. And when you think of facts, I think of text messaging because uh, there's a clear record of what's communicated. So if all of a sudden that parent is making really negative comments on text to the grandchildren directly or to the parents and maybe Facebook posts, and the grandchild is a Facebook friend. These are things a court will look at. Like I said, sub D is history of care of the child. That's what I was just talking about. E is the child, child's views and preferences giving due weight to the child's age and maturity unless they cannot be ascertained. Child's views and preferences can be important, but it also can be taken with a grain of salt. 
because if the child hasn't seen a grandparent in a year because the parent has refused and it's taken time to work your way through court, uh, that can then become a problem because their views and preferences may simply be parroting the parent. That's something a court is aware of. That's something a court would consider. But you're going to get into a very fact-based test of whether or not you think it's in the best interest of the child. We haven't highlighted it, but child's cultural, linguistic, religious, and spiritual upbringing and heritage, including Indigenous upbringing and heritage. Uh, this is a great one when the two parents are of a different heritage and one of them has passed away because the grandparent may say, it's up to me to uh, be able to teach these various issues to my grandchild because the other spouse doesn't even know how to do that. What the plans are for the child's care, the ability and willingness of each person whom the order would apply to care for can meet the needs of the child and the ability, willingness of each person to respect whom an order would be to communicate, cooperate. This all goes to you got to make an effort to get along and yet can't just make an effort, but you actually have to show that you're doing it. And that's where, again, text messages and social media can be really important because you may say, I'm trying to get along and then make some horrific commentary on social media. I remember I had one case where one parent wasn't grandparent, but one parent would do a took a voicemail message from their former spouse and did a talking head of, in a very defamatory way, listening to the message in the way the other spouse said it. And I told my client, you've got to get that down because if a judge sees it, it's going to look terrible. So you really got to be cognizant about what you're saying, who you're saying it to, how you're saying it, if you're thinking of engaging in this kind of uh, litigation. Like I said before, courts will usually defer to parents unless the parent dies or one of the parents has passed away. Grandparents are unlikely to be successful if, the, if both parents are disputing contact and there's no prior close meaningful relationship with the child. So easiest example there, a grandparent hasn't lived in the city of Toronto for years. The grandchildren are 10 years old, they move back to Toronto, they want to see that. I know there's people from across Canada and I'm focused on where I practice, but they move back to Toronto and they say, I want to see the grandchildren and the parents say, no, that grandparent is going to have a really tough case. It's going to be a hard one to win. And here's some cases I'm referencing. And the first one is an initial case, RMBLA, where courts have to consider each claim holistically with due regard for the child's need. No single factor is determinative. Judges analyze each case on facts and determine the most appropriate course of action. And this really gets to when you come in, when someone comes to see me, whether it's a grandparent's case or not a grandparent's case, I've been at this for 28 years now. And that means I have a good feel when I see a case, when I think it's a winning case or a losing case. And there isn't necessarily one factor, but when you hear the whole host of factors, you get a feel. Here's the next case. I could try and pronounce it, but I'm just going to get it wrong. So I'm not going to try. But question, does a positive grandparent-grandchild relationship already exist? Has the parent's decision imperiled that positive relationship? Has the parent acted arbitrarily? Now, I know when people are on the side of people talking about parental alienation, it was mentioned earlier, you often feel that way. But the practical reality is lots of people say it. It's another thing to be able to see it and prove it. And that's why I focus on things like text messages, social media, emails, because that may give those indications that you really want. Um, and things to look at for a positive grandparent-grandchild relationship. Barbara and Mangle, if a child has lived with the grandparent or spent a significant amount of time in their care, if a parent has passed away and an order will maintain the child's relationship with the other side of the family. Uh, Parent should not prevent a child from forming a meaningful relationship with a grandparent unless there's a good reason. So in summary, grandparents do have rights, but it's not a given, it's not an automatic, and you do have to hit certain circumstances and certain pieces in order to get it right. You have to remember all the time that it has to be framed in the best interest of the child. So if you're ever in a dispute with whether it's your child or it's your daughter-in-law or son-in-law, 
about seeing your children, I mean, grandchildren, you need to really be focused and watch the language that you communicate with them in. And in this day and age, it's not just social media because they could be recording the conversation. And you wanna focus in when you're saying things, don't say I have rights, I'm their grandparents. You need to focus in on the child has rights. It's in their best interest to know their grandparents. Their grandparents have a lot to offer and teach them. The grandparents shouldn't be cut off from the relationship because that's not what's good for the children. Don't use negative language that you want to. I mean, often when you're in these kind of disputes, it brings out a lot of anger, especially if your child has passed away and you're dealing with your former son or daughter-in-law. In, in those situations, be really, really mindful of your language. Every time you communicate, picture a judge is going to read your communication. Do they want, you want to be able to show that you are focused on the best interests of the child or the children. And that has to be your exclusive focus. It should, it should be focused on, you know, the children have been seeing me. The children need to have exposure to this side of the family. Uh, the children have a great relationship with everyone. It's in their best interest to do it. Be focused on the right language. Don't be focused on anger because that anger, if it conveys over to a court, and I've seen cases with grandparents parenting contact where they've lost because they've had so much anger in them and they haven't been able to control themselves around the grandchildren. And the court says, well, that makes sense. So you really have to think about your language. I have to add, every case can be very different on its facts. Every case can be unique. I remember I, we had one case here where the mother passed away and the child had been living their first 12 years at the grandparents' home with the mother. And we ran to court to get a court order and we were fighting with the father who lived at the other end of the country about where the children should live. That's a case where there's a high probability the grandchildren may end up living with the grandparents over the biological father because that's who they knew. That's where they grew up. That's where their relationships were. And quite frankly, the older the kids get, like I said earlier, the more important their say is. As kids get to be 15, 16 years old, in that scenario, they've always lived with the grandparents and they say they want to stay with the grandparents. That's probably what will happen. And I, I can say, you know, from my own perspective, my first high conflict case when I was a young lawyer was obtaining at the time it was called custody, but I got custody for the grandparents over their biological daughter with the consent of the biological father, uh, because that was in the best interest of those children, because the mother was quite frankly a mess and the father knew he was a mess and knew the kids were better off with the grandparents. So it's, it's always been something that's at the forefront of my mind since that was one of my first uh, high conflict cases when I started doing family law. Uh, subject to any questions, I think are the questions in the chat or is it in the Q&A? Because I'm happy to answer some questions because I see that we still have more time. Um, thank you. We do have uh, one question that was posed, Andrew. Um, it says, um, parents are divorced. Parent one has the a relationship breakdown with their parents. Can parent one prevent parent two from allowing the grandchild to see parent one's parents to the grandparents? Okay, I, I, I totally get that. We actually had a trial on this issue a couple of years ago uh, where someone was trying to do exactly that and they found it very frustrating and the answer is parent one can all anybody can suggest that certain it's not in the best interest of children to be around the third party so let's start with a situation where i may have repartnered and my new partner is a cocaine addict or an alcoholic the other parent can go to court and say well Andrew's entitled to parenting time with his kids, providing this girlfriend isn't there because she's such a horrible influence and she does all sorts of horrific things around the kids. So that applies to anybody. But there has to be more than a, I don't get along with my parents, that my parents shouldn't be around my children. If 
the parents are constantly making negative statements about their child, as an example, that may be a good reason. If they say, my child is horrible, my child, she was a cheater or he was a cheater and he took on numerous corporates and telling the kids all sorts of horrific things, that could be a reason for a court to make an order saying, no, these other grandparents, it's not in the best interest of the children and that parent shouldn't be able to do that. However, if they're normal grandparents who want to have a normal relationship, and I don't know that normal is really a good word to use anymore, but if the relationship is a good relationship, the court's going to say that the typically each parent makes decisions that are best for the children when they when the children are in their care. So when the child is in that parent's care, they get to say who the children see, whether it's the other person's parents, aunt, uncle, whomever. So unless somebody is really doing things foolishly, you're not going to be able to stop it. Thanks. There's another question that just came up. Um, to what age of the grandchild does the grandparent have rights? So is there a cutoff in age under Le legislation? Well, the legislation would be 18, but practically speaking, as a child gets older, they get to make their own decisions. No different in, parent in where they're going to live. Some kids that could be 13, 14, 15, 16, depending on the maturity of the child, depending on the logic of their decisions. You know, I remember one child, he was 12 years old and he's being interviewed by the office of the children's lawyer. And he said, didn't want to live with mom. They said, why not? Well, mom's moving to Stouffville. Well, why don't you like Stouffville? Well, Stouffville has a lot of garbage and it stinks. So five minutes later, the same person asked the child, have you ever been to Stouffville? No. Well, how do you know Stouffville stinks and smells and has a lot of garbage? You know somebody's being influenced. Or my favorite one of all was when a five-year-old came home and said to mom, how come you stand on street corners? You know, five-year-olds don't generally ask that question. So part of it is trying to understand what they want, but is it really the child that wants it? Are they old enough to convey what they want? All right, thank you. Um, there's just, there's a kind of a comment question. Uh, it has been my experience with the courts that the legal decisions only speak from the old British colonials perspective of the law. In 1999, the Supreme Court made the gratitude decision. I think that's right. Gladude, I'm not, um, to, uh, for criminal matters dealing with Indigenous peoples, permitting the judge to make, uh, sorry, to make create decisions about sentencing that might be outside traditional law. I've heard of no such initiatives for family court that acknowledges the great, the traditional influence of grandparents as an integral part of the greater family. Is there any such uh, gladude? I'm going to say that G L A D U uh, gladu for family court being considered in the works or existing law, and if not, why not? I'm going to start with A. I have not heard of that, but B, where I am geographically has not led me to having very much of a practice in the Indigenous community. So I wouldn't consider that a strength in my practice. Okay. Um, I don't know if we have any other yeah, questions. I see one more. Uh, there was just one person just made a comment that uh, their daughter had taken their granddaughter uh, back to another country to South Korea in August. And she has, um, she was to come back um, last December, but she has not come back. So the person's um, and missing that individual, but the son is still trying to help raise her. Um, and it must be difficult too when they when individuals move across country and then that lack of communication um, is even more strange because of the the distance. I would suspect. I I would think so as well. Uh, I would start with if it was a vac if the daughter in law took the child to Korea on a vacation and then said, I'm not coming back, I'm staying in Korea, that shouldn't happen. And then therefore the, I think it would be this, the son in that case would need to hire a, a lawyer in Korea. And I don't know off the top of my head whether Korea is a signatory to the Hague Convention, I'm assuming it's South Korea, uh, that I'm not sure whether they're a signatory. If they are, there's an international convention that would say the child has to be returned if the child was habitually resident in Ontario at the time of the unlawful removal. And when you say you're going somewhere 
on a vacation and you don't come back, that's considered an unlawful removal. There is a time limitation to make that, which I believe is one year, so you move as quickly as you can. But if your son agreed to the former daughter-in-law moving to South Korea, now she's relocated there, that's her habitual residence, and therefore Ontario law no longer has any jurisdiction over that child. Yeah, I think the, the one thing that uh, just some of the readings I've done, each um, province has their own le provincial legislation regarding um, like divorce acts. Is that correct? Or is it? They do. But when these amendments came into the Divorce Act in March 2020, March, sorry, came in, in a, I believe it was March 2020. I could be mixing up in my timing now because it was delayed at one point. Uh, but when they came into force, part of the reason for the delay was actually it was March 2021, I believe, when it came in. And part of the reason for the delay was that the provincial legislation wanted to mirror the federal legislation. The theoretical concept is just because you're common law versus married really shouldn't make a difference to the test of where a child should live or who should get to see the child. So most of the sections of the provincial legislation and the federal legislation will be almost identical. Not necessarily all of it, but most of it will be. So it's going to be very similar in every province. Great. I don't see any other questions. I'm just going to stop your screen share. And Sorry, folks. Oh. I see there's another question. Sorry. Oh, okay. Have you ever had or had a case where the grandparents were very much involved in the grandchild's life? The mother assaulted the grandmother in front of the grandchild and she using the grandchild as a pawn. I've seen cases where that does happen. What you really need to do is, and this is the problem with the case, is you should be going to court as fast as you possibly can when that happens to exercise your parenting time. Because this person says they haven't seen the child in two years, that makes the case a little more challenging and a little more difficult because of the delay. And I, I see she says she, we're trying. Hopefully you are in court because if you started the court proceeding right away, and I'll, I'll give an example, some courts are better than others. Toronto, you can get a court date fairly quickly. If you're in Brampton, as an example, I asked for a court date today and they're giving me May dates. So right away, there's a very long delay just to get your first date. And it partly depends on what court you're in will dictate the time period. And I don't see any other questions, but um, we don't, oh, there's another person. Oh, so the, someone was, just, she was, she was saying that the trial won't be until late September, but it's been a long time sort of oh. coming. If she has a trial date for September, then it says to me that uh, she's been through the court process for some time, which means it's much better than waiting two years and then going to court. It sounds like she did it right away. That's a good thing. Great. So we do have some time. I'm just going to have a few final slides to go through. Um, and so if you have any other ideas or questions that come up, please put them in the chat or the question box and we'll try to get to them. Uh, this is the contact information for uh, Andrew if you'd like to follow up. Um, they do have some really good uh, blogs, um, information uh, you'll see on YouTube, lots of educational information that they do post on a regular basis as well. Um, so thank you, Andrew, for uh, coming and sharing your information with us. It's been extremely uh, helpful, and I think educational for everybody that attended today. Just, um, just to go over the, um, just a few um, issues around uh, things that you can do if you are experiencing any other forms of abuse around um, you know, speaking to someone that you trust and that you have a relationship with, um, whether that's a friend or healthcare provider or other family member that you can speak to, or maybe get some professional help. Um, I know Andrew spoke about elder me uh, mediation. Um, there are elder mediation uh, services as well, and I'll give those that contact information in a minute. Um, but even seeking a counselor, because sometimes this can have an emotional toll on individuals, so seeking some professional help can also um, assist individuals in dealing with some of that emotional 
um, uh, impact that it may have. And, you know, when talking maybe to someone on a support line in person or telephone support can be helpful as well. Um, and then sort of that, maintaining that contact as well. And not be afraid to ask for help when you need it. Um, many of us um, uh, may be coming into these situations, you feel like you're all alone. This is the, I'm the only one that might be experiencing this. But in fact, there are many people who um, uh, may have uh, encountered uh, situations of abuse, whether that's uh, dealing with grandparent rights or other forms of abuse. Um, so reaching out for assistance is really encouraged for individuals. And being informed, right? staying informed about what your rights are. So even, you know, our presentation today really outlined what your rights are from a court perspective, um, what the legislation says and the supports that are available and what things to consider um, when you're going through these, these process. And Andrew did a really good job around, you know, even talking about different language. I never even thought about social media when I was uh, thinking about this because we do communicate so often using social media as a, as a tool to reach out to people. So, um, you know, there's some really good, uh, helpful information there. And just lastly, if anyone is ever afraid or feel fearful um, for their safety, uh, you know, to make sure that they do reach out for assistance if it's a, an emergency to call that 911 um, for help. Other legal um, uh, uh, avenues that uh, could be uh, also available um, is the Advocacy Center for the Elderly, which is based in Toronto, but their provincial organization uh, under the uh, legal, uh, legal Aid Ontario. Uh, but they specialize in seniors' issues. You may have seen them in, in the media. Um, they advocate many, many uh, times on many numerous issues for seniors. The Law Society Referral Service, um, you can uh, get online and ask for some support. They can link you with an uh, lawyer for about 30 minutes of free legal advice um, in the area of law that you require. There's a similar South Asian legal clinic that provides assistance for family. Um, uh, legal um, issues. Uh, if it comes to the point where there's a ha uh, human rights tribunal, that could, there's the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario. Um, and then if there's issues around capacity, the Office of the Public Guardian and Trustee for the person's uh, safety is, uh, if there are issues of safety and the person's incapable, um, the Public Guardian Trustee can get involved as well. And lastly, when we did talk about family mediation, um, there is an association of family mediation. I think Andrew did allude to, you know, getting that family. That might be a, a process of sitting down with someone just to work, uh, work things out if uh, you don't want to go through the court process. But that again, as my, Andrew mentioned, you have to have agreement with all parties to, to make that um, actually viable option for individuals to access. And there are two other organizations. Um, I'm not really familiar with uh, all the work that they do, but there's the Canadian Grandparents' Rights Association and the Alienated Grandparents Anonymous of Canada um, that provides some support and assistance for grandparents in these situations. And we have done questions. I don't see any more coming up. Oh, there's one more. Um, And lastly, just to have a check on our website, there's been some questions about if our webinar will be, uh, this information will be posted. Yes, the audio uh, visual uh, of today's recording will be posted as well as the PowerPoint um, will be posted as well. And next week we will have a blog on the grandparents right, which is based on uh, Andrew uh, the Feldstein Law Family Group, just to give a little bit more uh, context to the, some of the main points that he talked about today. And just as a reminder before we uh, sign off uh, that you, we really do appreciate you taking a few moments to fill out the evaluation form uh, just to give your feedback on today's session and maybe possible uh, sessions in the future. If you have, uh, if you want to reach out to myself or the organization, my telephone number is there and um, our, you can reach us by our email or sorry, by uh, our website, which has all the emails for all our staff as well. And um, we'd be more than pleased to, to assist you. Um, there was just another comment uh, before we wrap up that uh, 
there's another resource where uh, it's called Sheater, where it's there's a, a theater group that has been doing some work um, through radio uh, live plays uh, on elder abuse as well. So if people want a different um, uh, medium to to learn about elder abuse, Sheater is a great uh, resource. We've been working with them for many years. Um, they have downloadable resources, so they have podcasts, and they also um, had, they do they they were doing things in live in person, but you can find a lot of resources there for them as well. And they've been working on um, also expanding their work to the indigenous community um, that they are hosting and launching, I believe, in this September. So uh, if you want to go to shooter.com, I'd encourage you to do that as well. So thank you very much for joining us today. And Andrew, thank you again for taking the time out of your busy schedule to share your uh, legal expertise with us today. And I'm sure that many people have uh, really appreciated it from the comments that are coming in. And um, we thank you for your time and thank you for everyone who participated today in our session. Thank you for having me. Thank you.